I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, the revelation of a sort of blacklist of American rabbis by the chief rabbinate of Israel. And on that list, many prominent Orthodox rabbis here in America, in other diaspora countries, and in Israel. A story in the Jewish Week reports that the chief rabbinate actually has a list of 160 rabbis whom it will not trust when it comes to their conversions and therefore will not recognize them as Jews who may be married under Israeli law. 66 of those 160 are American rabbis and 20% of them are Orthodox rabbis, including such outstanding American Orthodox rabbis as Avi Weiss of the Hebrew Institute of Riverdale and the founding dean of Yeshivat Chovei Torah, and Rabbi Joe Potasnik, executive director of the New York Board of Rabbis. There's Joe's picture. This is not the first time the Orthodox rabbinate has drawn a line excluding rabbis in this manner in the past. Another revered American Orthodox rabbi, Haskell Luxtein, longtime principal of Ramaz and rabbi of Congregation Yehilath Jeshrin, was on the list, as was Rabbi Shlomo Riskin, founding dean of the Or Torah Stone Education Institutions in Israel, and he's also the chief rabbi of Efrat, Israel. The revelation of this list, obtained through an Israeli Freedom of Information Act by Rabbi Seth Farber's Jerusalem organization known as ITIM, which stands for the Right to Live Jewish. And by the way, I've looked at the entire list that ITIM has revealed, and it makes no sense whatsoever in terms of who is or is not on the list. So many prominent American rabbis from every movement, not just Orthodox, are not on the list. And even more bizarre, one of the conservative movement's most highly esteem esteemed rabbis, Seymour Siegel, longtime chairman of the Law and Standards Committee at JTS, the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, is on that list even though, sadly, Rabbi Siegel died in 1988. So in some ways, one has to ask, what's the point? Of course, this revelation follows on the heels of the ultra-Orthodox parties in the Israeli Knesset, forcing the government to renege on its compromise plan to create a third egalitarian section at the Western Wall followed only late, hours later by a Knesset decision cementing the Orthodox rabbinate's control of conversion in Israel, thereby determining who is a Jew for purposes of marriage. Well, even though he was not included on the rabbi blacklist, Orthodox Rabbi Mitchell Wahlberg could have been. He is the longtime rabbi of Beth Tefillah, congregation in Baltimore, Maryland, which happens to be the largest modern Orthodox synagogue in this country. And if you watch JBS, you've seen Mitchell many times. And he joins us now on our JBS phones from Baltimore. Mitchell, thank you for giving us some time. It's my pleasure, Mark. Mitchell, what was your reaction to the publication and revelation of this rabbi's blacklist? Well tell you the truth, at first I was upset when I realized that I'm one of the only people in the United States who wasn't invited to the Trump Tower meeting with the Russians and Trump Jr. and Jared <coughs> Kushner. But I accepted the reality of that. But when I didn't even make it to the blacklist, I, I don't know, I must be doing something wrong. <laughs> On the that contrary. honestly was my reaction, but the reality is... Everybody knows that this is going on. It's not a matter of blacklist or whitelist. It's a matter of the chief rabbinate has the power and uses the power, and there's one person in the rabbinate 
who does, in fact, investigate the names of rabbis that come to their attention. And rabbis from out of the country, their names can be coming either because they converted somebody or because a member of their congregation wants to go on Aliyah and needs a letter from their rabbi certifying that they are, in fact, Jewish, or somebody wants to get married in Israel and needs the permission of the Rabbanut. Now, they get a name of an American rabbi. They don't know who this rabbi is. Mm -hmm. So there's one guy stuck in some office in the chief rabbinate. It's his job to check out every one of these names. Mm -hmm. Who does he call to check them out? He calls like-minded rabbis. So if my name came before him, he doesn't know me. In fact, the rabbi who makes all of these decisions about American rabbis doesn't know a word of English. Mm -hmm. So he calls fellow ultra-Orthodox rabbis in Baltimore and asks them about me. So I need their approval. I understand. Is that the way the Jewish people have ever operated? I don't think so. I don't either. Okay. Um, by the way, has it ever happened? You've written letters for congregants who are making Aliyah, correct? Yes. Have you ever been questioned? I, in one case with the marriage, I had... Um, there were some questions, but you should know Seth Barber and Eaton, which you quoted, they are on the front line of this battle, and they made sure that uh, everything was acceptable. But Mark, I have to tell you something. When I convert someone, and I don't do too many conversions, when I convert someone and I give them the document, I said, let me tell you who I can guarantee will accept this document. Yes. Who? I can't guarantee anybody else. That's the world we live in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mitchell, there are two organizations, Orthodox organizations in America, that sort of are well known and, and in some way represent orthodoxy here in this country. One is the OU, the Orthodox Union. Most Jews are familiar with the OU label on foods indicating they are kosher. The other is the RCA, the Rabbinical Council of America. It's the organization of Orthodox rabbis. Are you a member of the RCA? Yes, I am. Okay. Mitchell, neither the OU nor the RCA has had any statement in response to this blacklist. Are you surprised? Do you feel they should respond? What's your attitude? Well, at this stage in my life, nothing surprises me. <laughs> if the Orthodox Union, it, this really isn't their area. They are primarily in Kashas and making sure that Orthodox synagogues don't hire Orthodox women as rabbis. Okay. That's um, their raison d'etre. The Rabbinical Council of America, there used to be a time that if you were a member of the Rabbinical Council of America, the rabbinate in Israel almost automatically accepted your documentation. Then the ultra-Orthodox in Israel started turning the screws, turning the screws, and the Rabbinical Council of America didn't want to break its relationship with the rabbinate in Israel, and so then it established its own courts, and only people from their courts would definitely be accepted by Israel. Uh, the person who put that all together is Rabbi Barry Freundel, who's now sitting in prison. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that one worked out that well. Yes. You know, the, the, yes? the Rabbinical Council of America, I have to assume at this point, still does not want to rock the boat with its relationship with the rab rabbinate in Israel. Okay, and so I'm, ask, if, I, I'm asking you, that, yes. as a member of the RCA, look, the RCA feels bound by the rulings of the chief rabbinate. That's your point. You're a member of the RCA. How does that make you feel about being a member of the RCA? I don't believe that the RCA is bound 
by the rulings of the rabbinate in Israel. It's just in its best interest to be working hand in hand with the rabbinate in Israel. How do I feel about that? The rabbinate in Israel is a totally corrupt institution. Totally corrupt. This system is corrupt. It is a political institution. It is not a religious institution. It is paid for and controlled by the government. The rabbinate in Israel, the chief rabbinate, I'm going to pay for this, Mark, and maybe my converts are going to be rejected. It's a farce. The chief rabbi of Israel, both chief rabbis, there's an Ashkenazic and Sephardic chief rabbi, both of them have one thing in common. Their fathers were the chief rabbis. Mm -hmm. Did anybody see anything wrong with that? Mm -hmm. And the Sephardic chief rabbi's brother is the chief rabbi of a community in Israel called Chalon, and just this week he was barred from giving any certifications because he violated the rules of the chief rabbinate. And the ultra-Orthodox who control the chief rabbinate because their votes pick the chief rabbi don't recognize the chief rabbinate. They don't eat food that's under the supervision of the chief rabbinate. They only eat food under the, uh, under the supervision of their own rabbis. And anything the chief rabbinate says means nothing to them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is there something wrong with this system? Mm-hmm. Obviously a rhetorical question. When you say that it's corrupt, you, you don't simply mean that in some way the chief rabbi, rabbi position is passed from father to son. In what way, explain to our audience, Mitchell, in a larger sense, what do you mean when you say, and it's a very dramatic statement, and again, you're, you're an esteemed Orthodox rabbi in the largest modern Orthodox synagogue of America. And I J- was all that this interview okay <laughs> on JBS yes. you are ca- you are calling the chief rabbi the orthodox rabbi in Israel corrupt what the does sis- the, the si- system is totally corrupt the rabbinical system in Israel the religious system in Israel employs thousands of people though they supervise mikvahs they supervise all of the kashrut they are supervise all of the weddings, all of the conversions, all of the divorces. This requires the employment of thousands of people. Many of those people, it's simply a patronage decision. It's not a religious decision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Mitchell, I speak often on JBS to Avi Shafrin, who is with the good of Israel. When he speaks to me, he speaks about Jewish principle and halakha. And I know, Mitchell, you're very committed to halakha. And what he says is, corruption aside, I don't know the extent he would or would not agree with you, but corruption aside, there is a Jewish principle from a strict Orthodox perspective, a strict halakhic perspective. And what he claims is that the chief rabbinate for whatever criticisms there may be of it, is committed to maintaining a a halachic integrity and authenticity, that that's why they care so much about kashrut. That is certainly, he argues, why they care so much about who is a Jew, how do you become a Jew, to what extent is the halachic concept of conversion maintained, and in some way, therefore, the integrity of Jewish lineage maintained in marriage. In terms of that argument, how correct is he? How do you see it differently? First of all, I'd be very surprised if Rabbi Tzapran eats food that's under the hashkach of the chief rabbinate. You ought to ask him that sometime. Secondly, everything he's saying is true. The only problem is it's his interpretation of what the halacha is. And that's how the Jewish religion works? 
there's more than one interpretation. Mm-hmm. The different views when it comes to conversion of what is absolutely required. Mm-hmm. They have established a standard that, that no exi- very few living Jews would be able to live up to. Yes, yes, yes. So what you're so saying... It's their opinion, and they keep putting in chief rabbis who they don't believe in, the secular don't believe in, and so there's a small element of the religious Zionists in Israel who still look to the chief rabbinate and more and more are breaking away from them. Mark, you can't mix politics and religion. Yes. yes. Oh, that in America. Yes. We see it, Israel, and it's no different, get this one for a quote, than what goes on in the Muslim countries. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, by the way, this is not the first time that the Orthodox community, the rabbinic community, has in some way created, I don't know if blacklist is the right word throughout you know, the last 55, 65, 75 years of American Jewish history, but you well know that Mordechai Kaplan an Orthodox, raised an Orthodox rabbi who then created the Reconstructionist movement was placed in cherem, which means he was excommunicated, by the Agudat Rabanim in 1945, and his sidur was burned, his prayer book was burned. And it's rare, but Mitchell, it's not the only time the Orthodox rabbinate has in some way felt even somebody who was as educated as... He li- Kaplan lived an absolutely halachic life, but they felt that his teaching was going to lead Jews away from halacha and away from the Jewish, their, their understanding of Torah. And he was put in cherem. And I happened to know him through my family. And he, uh, at a dinner once, he said to me the thing that upset him most in his life was the day he was put in cherem by the Orthodox rabbinate. What comment do you have to all this? I understand what the Orthodox rabbinate did then. I really do. He went so beyond the pale. He took away a supernatural God. He took away the chosen people. He took away the um, meaning of so much of the uh, Jewish religion as it had been practiced for thousands of years. He was entitled to his opinion, and people are entitled to follow him. But I can understand why the Orthodox rabbinate did that. I really can't. I don't like the idea of putting him in Cherem. Right behind. Hey, you're wrong. Right. Go away. Right. Right. Bother us. I yes. can understand that. But they're doing it to Orthodox rabbis. Yes. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes, I do. Mitchell, so how did and you feel? You know, Mark, I, I want to tell you something. Many years ago, there was a rabbi here in Baltimore, Rabbi Murray Saltzman. He was a reform rabbi, the rabbi of Baltimore Hebrew Congregation. Well known. A wonderful person. Yes. A wonderful Jew. He built the day school when it was unheard of for reform to have day schools. It committed to Israel. And just the menschiest guy around. So he calls me up once. He says, Mitch, I need you to do me a favor. I, my son is getting married in Israel. I need you to write a letter that he's Jewish because they won't accept it from me. His son was serving in the Israeli Defense Force. His father was a Ohav Yisrael in every sense of the word. But I had to write a letter for him, and I said to myself then, if they're barring Murray Saltzman... Someday they're going to come after me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's profound, Mitchell. So the, Mitchell, the noose, yeah. the noose just keeps getting tighter. Yes. By the way, how did you feel about the cabinet's decision to renege on its commitment to build a third egalitarian section at the hotel? What do they think this is, America, where the decision of the prime minister or the president can just be turned overnight? It bothered me very much. Mark, I want to tell you something. 
I'm not a flaming liberal when it comes to the issue of the Kotel. I have to be honest with you. I had an experience one year when I was on sabbatical, and I was in Israel, and it was a Sarabateves, what we'll call a minor fast day. But I decided I wanted to, I was in Tel Aviv at the time. I took the bus into Yerushalayim because I wanted to daven at the Kotel. It's a day we're thinking of the destruction of the temple. Yes. How can I be in Israel and yeah. not stand at the Kotel mm-hmm. and daven? Mm-hmm. So I went there. It was filled with Haredim. They always show up. Always, always, always. So I'm very sensitive. I'm very sensitive to infringing on their holy space. Having said that, it's a big wall and there's room for everyone. Mm -hmm. And if the government makes a decision saying yes, then to have the old, then to have the government reverse itself. Not for religious reasons, political reasons. Otherwise, the government would fall. It was all under the pressure of the ultra-Orthodox, which gave the rest of the people in Israel another reason to hate the Mm ultra-Orthodox. And to make it even worse, the ultra-Orthodox didn't want it and were opposed to it. I really understand. So say, listen, brothers and sisters, we love you. We care about you. We want to meet you at halfway on things. But please, understand, this is something very sacred to us. Please understand in this area. That would have been one thing. Hey, we're keeping you out of Israel. We're not really Jewish. And for them to throw dirty diapers at these women, come on. Mm-hmm. What happened to the Ahafta Lorey Ahakamocha? Love your fellow man. And now everybody is writing it during the three weeks and the temple was destroyed because of sinas chinam, because of senseless hatred. We're living through it. Mm -hmm. That's why the temple's never been rebuilt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Mitchell, you've seen that some have suggested that the way in which American Jewry should respond, should pressure Israel, whatever that means, to be more open to the non-Orthodox streams of Judaism in America and to modern Orthodoxy is by withholding money, by stepping back, withdrawing support for Israel. Some have even suggested American Jews should stop lobbying Congress on behalf of Israel. What's your response to all that? We didn't wait 2,000 years to withdraw support for Israel. It's absolutely out of the question. Mm -hmm. Israel, our homeland. Israel is our sacred trust. Israel is God's gift to us. We in our generation are witnessing miracles that our ancestors never could have imagined. Ethiopian jury. Russian jury, now European jury, we have some place to come home. I'm going to undermine its security. I'm not going to support. Look at all of the good that it has done. Having said that, I have to be honest. If I was a conservative or reformed Jew, I might say to myself, listen, I give $5,000 a year to Israel. I'm going to continue giving the $5,000, but I want to make sure it's not going to an institution, an organization that considers me a second-class citizen. Like what? How? I don't understand how that works. You know, well, I, Listen, it's harder for me to explain it in terms of Israel, but I can tell you my own country. I have people coming for different institutions you know, coming to my office because I have a charity fund. No, no, no. Just a minute. Min- not- Mitchell, Mitchell, just a minute. If yes. someone at the moment is giving money to a specific Jewish organization in Israel, it probably has nothing to do, that organization, with the chief rabbinate. There's no reason to withhold money. If one is supporting a, an orphanage in Israel, 
or if one is supporting the IDF, the FID, it, there's no point in not in taking money away from them. Nobody's giving money to the chief <laughs> rabbinate. So when you say, if you were an Orthodox, if you were a conservative, Reformed Jew, you would earmark your Mark, money differently. What does that mean? I, I would want to earmark it and make sure that it is going to, to some organizations that are working for pu pu pluralism, to some organizations like ETIM and others. I would want to make sure it is not going to support an ultra-Orthodox community that treats me like a second-class citizen. Yes, but I'm asking you what non-Orthodox Jew already is giving to the Orthodox rabbinate. Who are you talking about? What are you saying here? You're giving money through the Federation. It's eventually going down to, to who knows whom. And I think people should ask their Federations, where in fact is that money going? Okay, once you do that, you take that step. All Federation money is fungible. If, you, what, if what you're saying is, you don't want American Jews who are a former conservative to stop supporting the wait, federation wait, wait. system or uh, UJA. Well, that, that, that is what I, you're saying. That's what you're saying. I said if I were a reform yes. or conservative, yes. then I would have serious reservations of constantly being slapped in the face I understand. And having my money going to those who are inflicting the slap. Your money is never going to them. No, then you know something that I don't know. Do you give money to the chief rabbi? The money I give through the associated, it, it funnels into a government that distributes it in ways that I think we should have more understanding and input. Well, this is a discussion you and I ha have to have in, in, in sort of exclusive, the exclusive topic, because I understand what you're saying. I just don't think it's realistic, but I, I really want to investigate it more with you, so you will let me do that the next time we talk. Mitchell... Mark, it may not be realistic, but if that's not done then you're accepting the reality of the situation and agreeing that it will remain unchanged. Not at all. Not at all. In and my, there's some other way of changing it. By the way, the problem is we don't know yet. But to punish Israel economically... I didn't say to punish Israel. The, it's the same it, amount of money going to Israel. Just making sure that it's going to, uh, to interest in Israel that stands for what we stand for. It's not possible. All you can do if is... It's not, it's not possible. Then we'll have to come up with other way. Okay. Well, you and in I will... Theory, we, we will continue. In theory, do you agree with me? No. Do I, I think no American non-Orthodox Jew, and I don't think you, as a modern Orthodox rabbi, should be funding the chief rabbinate. But I don't want to start saying, oh, you know, cut your donation to Federation or UJA or to any, any Jewish organization that is an umbrella because maybe some of that money will end up in the Israeli government and some of that money will go to the ultra-Orthodox. If I was a conservative or reformed Jew under the circumstances, I would tell my Federation, I want the Federation to do whatever is possible to assure that the money we are sending to Israel is going to organizations and institutions and causes that are not undermining my Jewishness. Okay, not there we are. Okay, then we agree 100%. By the way, it is always fabulous to talk to you, Mitchell. And uh, the fact Thank that you, you always give me time is wonderful. Thank you for being there for me. Have a wonderful rest of the summer. We'll talk again soon. My pleasure. Take care. Thank bye you. bye. The thoughts of Mitchell Wahlberg, the beloved rabbi of Beth Philo Congregation in Baltimore, Maryland. It's the largest modern Orthodox synagogue in America. As always, my thanks to our director today, Serge Goldberg, sitting in for Sloan Copeland, JBS's associate director, Dara Golub, John McDevitt, 
editor, and Dennis Golan. And Dennis is leaving JBS for postgraduate studies and other work. We wish Dennis every success. Best of luck, Dennis. And to the producers of this edition of In the News, Carol Lilienthal and Jan Weiss. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends.